Welcome to this two-part presentation on studying for the anaesthesia primary exam. I'm usually reticent to dish out advice of this nature because first, you've all made it this far, therefore you probably know what you're doing. And second, you've been doing it your way for almost 20 years now and the chance of you radically changing your approach is very low and understandably so. Nevertheless, upon viewer request, I have cobbled together my thoughts. In this first video, I'll be sharing with you my general thoughts on the, the approach to exam preparation. In the second video, I'll be offering specific advice pertaining to each section of the exam. But first, a word of caution. When a distance runner with the aerobic capacity of a sled dog attributes his victories to his mental toughness and racing strategy, take that with a grain of salt. Likewise, Beware the prize winner who tells you that the key to passing the anaesthesia primary exam is to employ his patented short answer question strategy. For all you know, he might have succeeded in spite of his strategy, not because of it. What I'm getting at here is that there is no substitute for knowledge. The downside to this is that you have to put in the work. The upside is that unlike your VO2 max, you can augment your knowledge of the basic sciences by an enormous degree. What you choose to read is totally up to you. However, I strongly recommend you read the primer for the primary exam written by former chief examiner Mark Reeves in order to direct your learning. It's the single most useful document of its kind in my opinion. You can find this document by entering this term into any search engine. I also suggest you download Mac 95 and use it for your SAQ revision. It collates all the SAQs from the past 20 years along with the examiner's reports and several sets of model answers. I suggest you avoid reading huge books from cover to cover. Instead, be guided to the best parts of them by people who have done the reconnaissance work for you, like Mark Reeves and his colleagues. I would caution you also against reading a single textbook which attempts to cover the entire syllabus. The reality is that some authors are better at explaining pharmacokinetics while others are better at explaining cardiovascular physiology. As a result, you will need to read bits and pieces from many sources. Once again, this is where the primer comes in handy. I wouldn't recommend using the SAQs as a sole guide to your learning because, while there are a great many of them, there are also plenty of topics which have not been assessed in SAQ format, but nevertheless make frequent appearances in the vivas. The physiological effects of hypothermia is one such example. There are plenty of people who advocate learn using the learning outcomes to guide your study, the reason being it means you are less likely to miss out on a particular part of the curriculum. This wasn't the approach I took, and as a result I found myself unable to answer a question on the receiver operator characteristic during one of my vivas. However, my view is that if you use the learning outcomes to guide your study, you will find yourself seeking answers to a large number of open-ended questions. If you simply make your way through the recommended reading, then you are likely to proceed more efficiently and there will be very little examinable material that you won't cover. However, many people will disagree with me on this point. Next, don't discount the role of the internet. I often used Google Image Search and Wikipedia during my first foray into a topic, but of course, we mustn't use such things as a single source. There are also uh, many reputable web sources, some of them you'll be familiar with, and these include BJA Education, Deranged Physiology, and Life in the Fast Lane. I used to watch plenty of YouTube videos on days I wasn't feeling quite so motivated, but still felt I ought to do some work. Eric Strong's channel, uh, called Strong Medicine, is particularly good in my opinion. Lastly, I've compiled a list of resources on my website. This is not a complete list, nor is it anywhere near as good as the primer. It's, it is instead a list of things that I found useful, but not many other people seem to know about or use. As for how you go about your learning, this is my two cents worth. First, you need to learn the content. There are some instances where it is preferable to learn by understanding. Pharmacokinetic concepts 
such as the time constant and the rate constant, fall into this category. It is not sufficient to simply memorize the definitions of such terms. There are other instances where learning by rote is a better option, and sometimes it's the only option. To that end, I suggest you revise tables of MAC values, saturated vapor pressures, and blood gas partition coefficients on a regular basis. Stated differently, I think that both old school learning and new age learning have their place. Be wary of people who tell you that one or the other is the only necessary ingredient. Second, you need to consolidate your learning. I think of this as a process of mental cleanup. The goal is to transform a vague understanding into a refined, condensed product that can be more easily encoded into long-term memory. These notes can be very brief indeed. In fact, the shorter they are, the more likely you are to remember them. A consultant recently suggested to me that the management of anaphylaxis includes oxygen, fluid and adrenaline. I defy you to do it more simply than that. This is an example of the kind of notes I'm writing for the part two exam at present. I'm making them as brief as I possibly can. Third, you need to practice recalling what you have encoded. There are two reasons for this. The first is that this is what will be required of you in the exam. You won't be asked to explain a topic with an open book. Instead, you will have to dredge up information from the recesses of your mind. Like any other skill, this is one you need to practice. The second reason is that this is the single most effective means of supercharging your synapses, in my opinion. The price you pay for this is that it is mentally taxing and it is psychologically painful, given that you'll be alerted to deficiencies in your knowledge. I can't say for sure why this me method is so effective, but it might have something to do with the bursts of emotion tagging the information you are trying to recall. Either you experience the satisfaction of having recalled the fact, or the disappointment of having forgotten it. With reference to the learning process and the retrieval process, I want to introduce to you the concept of layering within our memory faculties. These ideas are mostly my own and therefore I suggest you take them with a grain of salt. Some of you may have reflected that it is quite easy and quick to learn to ride a bicycle as a small child, despite the fact that this task requires hundreds of muscles to perform coordinated actions and respond to subtle sensory feedback within a fraction of a second. In the same way, we know that patients with Alzheimer's disease are able to improve their ability to perform a novel motor task, even if they have no explicit recollection of previous attempts. Many of you will have noticed that you can recall the melody, lyrics and dance moves from a catchy pop song after listening to it only a couple of times, and that it can still roll off your tongue years later. All of you will have realized how difficult it is to learn the list of drugs that induce the cytochrome P450 enzymes in comparison with the aforementioned tasks. The reason for this is that the nature of these memories are not the same. To return to anesthetic analogies, you learn to intubate using your procedural memory. You learn about the approach to obstructed ventilation, mostly using your episodic memory, which is to say that you call upon your past experiences and you learn the causes of hypoxemia using your semantic memory. I don't know the exact reason why there is such disparity in our, our ability to form the memories just described, but I expect it has something to do with the different evolutionary ages of these systems. Our ancestors were able to learn motor tasks eons before they learned to tell stories, and they learned to tell stories a long time before they were able to conceptualize and describe scientific facts. Therefore, these faculties are variably developed. The problem we face as we study is that while the semantic memory system encodes information with great accuracy at high resolution, it is less efficient in every other way. That is, semantic memories are harder to make, they are harder to recall, they are not as long lasting, and they are prone to crumbling when scrutinized by an examiner. Therefore, my practice and my recommendation to you is to pair up lower order systems with the higher order memory system so that we can eat our cake and have it too. What do I mean by this? In the comfort of your own home, 
you can articulate information out loud to the ether as if you were explaining it to another person. You can tell ridiculous stories that link disparate pieces of information, although this is not an approach I use very often. You can mime a physical explanation of a concept, and you can draw pictures and diagrams to accompany your explanations. I recommend you use this approach both when you are learning information and when you are trying to retrieve it. Let's use an absurd example to demonstrate just how effective this technique is. Some of you might recall that the Rene and Weber tests involve interrogation of ear function using a tuning fork, one at the ear and the other on the forehead. Can you recall which is which? If not, make a wanker sign on your forehead and this distinction will be with you for life. I suggest you start studying early since there is a lot of material to get through and cramming is not much fun. I spent about a year and a half studying specifically for the primary exam. For most of this time, I continued to attend social occasions, visit family members and go to the cinema now and again. However, during the final six months or so, I was doing very little other than writing the answers to the SAQs that many of you will have seen online. I appreciate that many people prefer a shorter and more intense period of study in order to limit the period of time during which your life is put on hold, and that's a perfectly valid point of view. I also recommend that you assign a period of time to each topic. Many people will assign a fortnight to cardiovascular, fortnight to respiratory, a fortnight to pharmacokinetics, and so on, and that works pretty well for the primary exam. However, there are other ways to do it. For example, this is the vague plan I've come up with for my final exam preparation. It doesn't matter so much if your plan isn't perfect the first time you write it down, because you can modify it as you go, and even an imperfect plan will help you allocate your time. At some point during my preparation period, I decided, at the suggestion of a strange man on the internet, that I would pay attention to the little voice in my head telling me what I ought to be doing that day. My expectation was that I would be ruled by an internal tyrant who would make me study from dawn to dusk every day I had off work, and that I would never get to do anything fun. What I found instead was that on days when I felt rested, it would tell me for go for, to go for broke. And after night shift, sometimes it would tell me to lie in bed or do whatever I felt like doing. As a result, I got through large amounts of work without procrastinating, and I also got to rest and do things I enjoyed without having those experiences ruined by guilt. However, if you're going to adopt this approach, then you've got to play straight with yourself. If you make a schedule which is too demanding, or if you don't let yourself rest when you said you would, then you will rebel against your inner tyrant by daydreaming or by wasting time on your phone during time which you had allocated to studying. Or at least that's how it was for me. For example, I have to be on night shift tonight, therefore I have assigned myself some modest academic plans for today and just a few tasks around the house for tomorrow. As with the long-term plan, you can update your plan for the day ahead as you acquire new information. So, if there are no cases tonight and I sleep straight through, I might instead decide to review landmark publications tomorrow and reward myself with a whole day off at the weekend. This marks the end of the preachy part. We will now move on to some specific and practical advice regarding the exam.